there and welcome back to the channel. In last week's episode, we brought you action in a game that I played called No Knit Thursday. This is a weekly live stream found on YouTube's Live at the Reserve where someone took down a $2,900 pod in a $1, $3 poker game. So make sure you check out all that action as it was a whole lot of fun putting that one together. In this week's episode, we're going to bring you action from day one of event one that launched the celebration of the three-year anniversary for Live at the Reserve. It's a $50,000 guarantee prize pool with $11,000 up top. And since this is tournament action, much of what you see has been recreated in such a way that should prove to be quite educational as well as entertaining. So let me know in the comments down below if you'd like to see more hand reviews like this. Hey, enough of this chit chat. Let's get into the action. get to the club around 10.30 Friday morning and I'm super excited to see so many of my poker pals, including number 54, Sherry Hathaway, right there in front of me. <laughs> She's a reg here at the reserve and, well, we've battled it out a few times on the felt, including both the live streams as well as tournaments. And even though I'm over 350 miles from Pittsburgh, somehow this room makes me feel at home as I take my seat, grab my chips, and start to prepare to take on this day. Blind levels start at 100-100, and after we hear that familiar announcement to shuffle up and deal, the first hand is dealt. I start to fiddle with my spinner a bit as I watch players around the table make the call one by one. Then I see that I've got a playable hand in the big blind as I look down at 9-10 of diamonds, so I get a little funky and race to 700 to try to thin the herd, <laughs> but end up with all five players calling. That's when the dealer puts out a flop of Queen-4-10 rainbow. Now this flop has hit me like a freight train flying through a paper wall, so I lead out with a bet of 2K just to see where I'm at. I get seat one to call, everyone else folds, and we now see the pot is slightly over 7,500 bucks. The turn comes, it might seem to be a bit of a brick, but honestly, I don't think this guy was calling a raise with 7.5, <laughs> but hey, it's possible. And just in case, I know it's way too early to keep getting cutesy here, so we go check, check. The river is my money card. A sneaky ten of clubs, which gives me a full house. Now, I suppose the villain might have thought I had some sort of weird straight. Jack eight, maybe. Perhaps he had me on two pair. I guess queen ten makes sense. He leads out for 10k this time, and so I play with my chips a little bit, trying to go for that Oscar, and... After a few shuffles of my chip, I quietly announce a raise to 20k, hoping that he might call this men click. <laughs> Boy, he does not disappoint as he snap calls with his nut flush. And then I show him the bad news as I scoop in a pot that's now got me close to a double stack. I go a bit card dead for a few orbits because I'm fighting off a little bit of that winner's tilt. It's a thing, you know. But I'm not so sure I got this one down. Here's why. Blinds are at 200-400 with a $200 ante. There are two middle position limpers in front of me and I'm in the hijack position with pocket fives. So I decide to flat and the button makes a disciplined fold. Both blinds are in. We're now five ways to a flop that comes five, six, ace, rainbow. And I flopped my first set in about a month of tournaments. <laughs> Both blinds check. The first limper in middle position, he leads out for 1200. The second flats and I decide to trap and smooth call as this board favors at least one of those limpers, and with my set of fives, I certainly want to keep this board live. Both blinds fold. We're now three-handed to the turn, and it is an action card. It's the king of spades. This time, both limpers check over to me, and I think at this point, I've got a stranglehold on this pot. Also, I think I spotted a tell from one of those limpers, because he really liked that turn card. So I put out a reasonable bet of 2100 into a pot of 58. Much to my chagrin, however, both limpers come along and I really only wanted one caller. So I'm praying for a brick at this point because I'm not sure why they both called. The river delivers the four of diamonds. Again, both limpers check. And I honestly don't know what to make of this move. 
Could they both have Ace King? Then I remembered the advice of an old poker friend of mine who once told me, you can't win a multi-day tournament on day one. So, like in it, I turn over my set. The first limper shows down Ace King for two pair. And the other limper, well, he shows down the 7-3 of spades for a missed flush. But he hit his river straight. Methinks we have our next river rat inductee as he boldly states, 7-3 is my favorite hand. And on the very next hand, I'm on the button. Still a little bit steamy from that last one, and I look down at 10-4 off suit. Just me and the blinds. The flop comes down, 5-6-7 rainbow. The big blind leads out for 800. I call small blind folds. The turn, it comes the king of hearts, and we both go check, check. Then after making a yo bet here, I river the straight with a three of diamonds and get snap called. I table my hand, and we still don't know what our villain has. And after a few rounds of folding, I start to get a little bit restless, as I sometimes do in tournaments. And then I look down at a couple suited diamonds. And even though this play is not recommended under the gun, I decide to toss out the call as folds go around to the small blind, who decides to raise to what seems to be the table standard at this point, $1,100. Then Rudy, a favorite rag at the reserve, he decides a three bet is in order, so he pumps up the price of poker to 3,200 bucks. Now, I didn't just drive 350 miles to be in this 50K guaranteed tournament to fold like a knit, even though I did so earlier. I figure it might just be my turn to get lucky and I wanna grab some chips. So I smooth call here and the original razor, he comes along as well. That's when Nick gives us this flop of king, four, five, two spades. Both blinds check, and once I figure out this board texture truly favors my hand, not necessarily my range, I glance down at my stack, make a fast SPR calc, and decide to check as well. We interrupt our regularly scheduled hand analysis to bring you some exciting math about poker. According to our friends at 888-POKER, one of the concepts used for determining whether or not a speculative hand should be played is your stack-to-pot ratio, or SPR. This method can be used to determine the relationship between the size of a player's stack to the size of the pot in the middle. It's calculated by dividing the smallest stack size involved in the hand by the size of the pot on the flop. Here's the formula. SPR equals effective stack size divided by pot size. Where effective stack size is how many chips you have, pot size is the total amount of chips already in play, SPR is the number that's reduced to the lowest denominator. For example, if both you and your opponent have $200 and the pot is 10, the SPR would be 20. This number helps players to assess their level of commitment to a pot with certain hands. A lower SPR indicates a higher level of commitment, suggesting that a player will be willing to go all in with a strong-like hand. And conversely, a higher SPR means there's more flexibility and less immediate commitment, allowing for more strategic play post-flop. Using SPR effectively does require a couple very important strategic steps. Number one. Understanding that a low SPR, 1 through 5, indicates a strong commitment to the pot, suitable for stronger hands, a medium SPR, 6 through 10, would offer some flexibility, while high SPR, above 10, that suggests less commitment to the pot and more room for post-flop play. The second item to remember, if you do happen to have a low SPR, you should be ready to go all in with your strong hands, and with higher SPR, well, you can play more speculative hands that can improve on later streets. Remember, SPR is not about the rat math. It's also about integrating this concept into your overall strategy to help you make better decisions at the table. Now back to our regularly scheduled hand analysis already in progress. The turn comes what now looks to be an action card as Rudy glances at both stacks to his left and right, and I think he might have spotted someone ready to toss out a few chips. Okay, that was me, but hey, I just turned to hidden straight. Rudy thinks he's ready to snag those chips I've already counted out and shrewdly checks... I, of course, do not disappoint him, as I then lead for 7K, glancing over at the small blind to see what he's about to do. And without hesitation, our villain there raises to 17K. <laughs> That's when we now see Rudy folds his set of sixes. I told you this guy was good. And looking down at this flop, I see that it's a bit coordinated, and I start to think about what hands this villain could have. I don't think he has a better straight. Not sure he would do this with a naked pair. Maybe it's a nut flush draw? Still, I come to the conclusion that slow playing my straight here is either going to be the right move or the wrong move for day one, event one. And I decide to flat the 17K so that I can reevaluate with our river, leaving way less than a pot-sized bet in my stack. Whew. 
The small blind wastes little time as he leads for three purple chips, uh, 15K. I ask how much he has behind, knowing that this bet pretty much has me covered. But he remains stoic and does not utter a single sound. So I call for what's essentially my tournament life. He tables his king queen of spades, to which I give him the bad news. I drag in the pot, and I'm back to just under 100K as we get closer to our first break. Now, I'm still stacking my chips from that double up, knowing that this is the last hand as we do head into our break, so I'm less than enthusiastic about this one. Until I find the greatest hand in poker. I take a deep breath and call out a sizable raise to 2400 I think this will either look silly to some and I'll get pushed back, or everyone will toss their cards into the muck and head on out to their break. Good news comes in the form of an all-in from our cutoff, as his small stack is sitting right around 20 k He jams with his jiggities and the board runs out clean for our aces, so we scoop another pot. Easy game. What a roller coaster level that was. Let's get into the camper and we'll do a little quick hand breakdown. We've got eight minutes on a break. Oh, okay, um, let me put on my other glasses so I can actually see, because I have notes for this. Okay, I, got a, I actually took a picture here. I'm in the small blind holding ace-jack off suit, and Rudy, who's just to the right of me, he had, uh, well, he's probably steaming a little bit from the pocket sixes hand that he had to fold to me earlier. He makes a pre-flop raise to 1500. I have ace-jack off suit in the small blind, and I see out of the corner of my eye the big blind, he's getting ready to fold. So I want to isolate these other couple limpers that are out there. So I make a three bet of 7,500 and it works. The big blind, the two limpers fold. And that's when Rudy just makes a smooth call. We go to a flop. The flop is ha, ace, four, 10, two spades. I check top pair, decent kicker. And Rudy shoves all in for 17K. I go ahead and make the call. He tables down a seven off suit. So I don't know. I guess he was steaming. So uh, I win a pot, 38K. The next hand, I've got the big blind with a couple of Broadway cards, king 10 off suit. I make a preflop raise of 4K. The blinds were 500 and 1,000. I get the same caller who I had earlier done some battle with. Uh, he makes the call there. He, uh, the flop comes down two of clubs, eight of spades, 10 of hearts. The turn is another 10. I've got a set or three of a kind and um, he goes all in. I snap call him and he was shocked as he turned over a king nine off suit. He said at the, uh, after he's raking in my chips that he thought I had queen 10 and that's why I called so fast. Honestly, I just wasn't paying much of attention. So now I'm donked off 10K to him, but I get those back like three hands later when I'm holding ace four of clubs. I like those ace fours, right? Flop comes queen, deuce, five, uh, the queen and the deuce were the clubs. The five was the diamond. Um, villain's first to act. He leads out for 7K into a pot of 65, which I thought was kind of interesting. So I, I shove with my flush draw. And he calls with top pair. Pretty strong kicker. I think it was ace queen. Uh, I don't know. Ace queen something. Then the miracle club comes on the turn. I'm back to over 200K. Woohoo! So I'm finding it pretty hard to film uh, while this tournament's going on. So I'm trying to take pictures as much as I can, but I'm definitely taking notes on my phone. That's what I'm looking down at here. And I hope you've enjoyed it so far. I think you have. If you, if you do, you know what to do. Um, oh, shoot. I want to get something to eat and we're almost over on break. So we'll see you back in there. And once we get back from break, I find more folds than a robot in a bedsheet factory until we get to the 816 and 8 level. That's when I wake up in the big blind with a monster. That's right, folks. It's the return of the best dang hand in this game. Those sweet red aces. I give a quick look around the felt and see that there's already a couple of folks in the pot, including that same villain I was battling with earlier. Could I really be doing it to him again here? Oh, wait a minute. That's the other guy. I already sent him packing. This is the two-pair dude that tried to end my tournament before break with his king-queen. Ha! but I showed him with my turn straight. Let's see how I run with this primo hand. I decide to make a pot size bed of 12K and we're right back to the cutoff who most likely has revenge on his mind. So he thinks about his next move and decides to flat, both button and small blindfold. 
The turn comes 8-5 deuce rainbow, essentially a brick flop, so I decide to lead out for another sizable bet of 20k, only this time I'm hoping to either end the hand or force them all in. I hope for the latter, but will be happy with the former, especially since I now have them covered and then some. <laughs> well, this fella is all too familiar with my aggressiveness at the table, and he figures this hand is just about as good as any others in this spot, and decides to shove his remaining stack in the middle, roughly 32-5. And as the dealer looks my way as if I needed to know who was next to act, I snap all in like a turtle in a koi pond. And as we table our hands, I see the good news. His reaction, however, was priceless as I see that look of <laughs> holy Toledo come across his face. We know his pocket nines were simply no match for these weapons of mass destruction. And the turn, well, she comes the sweet queen of clubs. But my heart, mm, sure breaks, was some of you probably already guess. Here comes that old river rat, the nine of spades. And with that hit, we're back down to 120. Then what seems like comes out of nowhere, I feel like I hit a brick wall. Maybe you know this feeling in tournament play where you have decent starting hands, but nothing ever seems to materialize. Well, that's what happened next. And all of a sudden I find my chips just spiraling downward and I can't seem to get anything to go my way. Now I know I need to avoid playing marginal hands because of the ICM considerations, but sometimes even the most well-executed play is no match for those luck boxes out there. Here's an example of one of those plays that ends my quest to head on into day two. Blinds were at 3,000 and 1,500 with a 1,500 ante. Folds come around to me in the cutoff and I'm staring at the lovely ace jack of hearts. I make a 3x bet to 18,000 and only the big blind calls. The dealer, he puts out a fairly decent flop for me. The jack deuce four with two spades. And I know that with my current SPR hovering right around five to seven, I'm pretty confident that I'm ready to put my chips to work here. Now the big blind had been a very active player to this point and definitely has me covered. So when he leads out for a pot sized bet of 20K, it was only a couple shuffles of my chip stack and I uttered these words for what could be my last all in. And after the count was given to confirm my stack of 127,800, our villain makes the call with his third nut flush draw. That's right, folks, and his queen nine picks up even more outs on the turn, but it was the 10 of clubs that claimed my tournament life. So it's on to the next flight for me. Remember Winner's Tilt from earlier in the episode? Well, this one was real tilt as it put me out five from this flight's bubble. And even though I didn't make it into day two, there's always other big events coming up like the one we see right here. I'll be back to try my skills at that one once again, and I hope to see you there as well. And if you've made it this far, sure would be awesome if you'd smash that like and subscribe button as it will help other folks just like you to find our channel. So I'll see you next Wednesday with even more poker excitement and fun. And as always, play smart, play with heart, and always have fun. This is Marty, and you've been watching Reflections of a River Rat.